Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you the first in their exciting new series of broadcasts on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Each week, Hallmark will bring you true-to-life stories of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Presented on the Hallmark Hall of Fame by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Let us now praise famous men, the Bible says. But to praise the famous, we must know them truly. You do know the heroes of bronze and marble and monument and song. But too many heroes, men and women alike, have gone unsung, without applause. They've earned fame without receiving it. To those people whose service, sacrifice, and devotion achieve great things, too little known to us, Hallmark respectfully dedicates this Hall of Fame. And tonight, Hallmark honors Henry Miller Shreve as we tell the true and exciting story of the man who fought insuperable odds to bring steamboats to the Mississippi and push the frontier back. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying Hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, let the Hallmark on the back be your guide. For that Hallmark tells your friends, you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Bad and the Beautiful, starring Lana Turner, Kirk Douglas, Walter Pidgeon, and Dick Powell. And now here is Lionel Barrymore with your Hallmark Hall of Fame. Everybody knows about Old Man River. The Mississippi and its colorful river steamboats, their pilots, skippers, the leadsmen eternally taking soundings in the tricky waters. The Mississippi where the Robert E. Lee raced the Natchez while America waited on the levee, waited for the Robert E. Lee. The Mississippi and the smoking whip snorters, all energy and daring and American right down to their keels. We know about those great boats, but how many of us know about the man who was responsible for steamboats and their mighty commerce on the father of waters? Listen. Go back before the whistle, to the river threading the wilderness, to the war canoe and the barge, the trading post above St. Louis, 1810. Well, let me see. I won't take the dimity right now, but Dad wants the walnut gun stock he was looking at, and the neat foot oil, and I believe uh, excuse he Excuse me. I'm looking for an A-1 river pilot. Can you help me, sir? Huh? Well, excuse me. Oh. oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Oh, go right ahead. Barge men will barge. Hmm. Well, I'm taking a, a load of furs down the river from the Ohio. You're what? And I need a pilot from here to New Orleans. You'll need more than that. I never heard a trade coming down this far from that far. <laughs> you will, though. Someday that river's going to carry trade from New Orleans to the Great Lakes and back. Indeed. Yes, indeed. And I'll go somewhere else for a civil word and a good pilot. I know of a good pilot. Oh? I 
uh, I have that on the best authority, of course. He's my father. Would you like to speak to him? Yes, I would. His name's Alonzo Blair. I'm Henry Miller Shreve, Miss Blair. Come with me, Henry Miller Shreve. The river is many things. In 1810, the river was a yellow noose to trap ships and men, or a golden cord to bind Henry Shreve to his bride. Eighteen hundred and eleven. Again, Henry Miller Shreve appears on the Mississippi. This time, he guides an immense 95-ton barge down the hostile, shifting river. This time, he has a wife with him, Mary Blair. No, I love the sunset on the river. I love to slip past near the shore and watch people stare at us as though it isn't true. <laughs> there is something new under the sun, huh? We're Argonauts. That's what we are, and I'm proud. Argonauts? Aren't we? Oh. We're obsolete already. Steam, that's what's next for the Mississippi. Robert Fulton thought so. His New Orleans struck a snag and sank at Natchez. Yeah, he failed. But I'm going to bring steam to the Mississippi to stay. In a large zinc bucket, I know. <laughs> In a tub. With the biggest, fastest, handsomest tub that ever drew fresh water. Shoals and snags and whirlpools and all? And currents and flood and sunken wrecks and shifting channels and all, yes. Steam. Yes, but built for the river, Mary. Broad beam and shallow draft with the engines above deck. And, and power, power to shove a boat over the reefs when we can't avoid them. Or break a boat to matchwood. Don't you believe in it, Mary? I just say, let's do it now while we're young and tough and can swim. Mary. <laughs> You're a pilot's daughter, all right. And a steamboat's bride. <laughs> <laughs> Old Man River, he just came rolling along then, too. 1815, timber topples in the stillness of a new world, timber for a new ship. Fulton had his folly, but Henry Miller Shreve had his tub of steam at last. The Steamboat Enterprise, New Orleans, 1815. There she floats at last, Mary. We'll be off in... Oh, two hours. Oh, she's so beautifully ugly, isn't she? I love her. Oh, maiden voyage. Louisville a bust. We are going to bust, Henry. Yeah, we'll make it all right. We've got to. We will. The river is powerful and impatient and jealous. It's not going to take kindly to steam or steamboats. I'm not a bit worried. No, uh, you're not? Not a bit. Well, that embarrasses me. I'm worried. Plenty. Uh, he wants you, Henry. Mr. Henry Miller Shreve. That's right, Sergeant. Orders from General Andrew Jackson, sir. General Jackson? But you're not under military orders. Let me read it, Mary. Powerful British fleet has landed an army near New Orleans, ma'am. General Jackson has been attacked at Charmette, below here on the river. Oh. I'm to take a cargo of guns and ammunition down the river to Charmette. Unload your cargo for Louisville? I'm afraid Louisville will have to wait. You may find some British guns commanding the river above your destination, sir. Run past guns with an unarmed steamboat? At night, of course, ma'am. Henry, you'll wreck the Enterprise on our first trip. In that case, we'd build another Enterprise, wouldn't we, Mary? Somehow? Yes, Henry, forgive me. Now, where are the guns for General Jackson, Sergeant? Gingerly, the Enterprise puts about in the swirling, treacherous river. Beats cautiously towards Chalmette, a few miles below New Orleans. Darkness. Not a sound from the stilled engines, not a light. 
Warn the men not to stir their fires. A spark from the stacks. We may be dead men. Isaac. Tiptoe on the yellow water, Henry Miller Shreve. Your ship and your dream may die by gunfire tonight. Or by Mississippi mud. Tread lightly, Enterprise. Go softly. 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 I do think so. Uh, beyond any possible enemy gunfire, this blind drifting is dangerous. A bit longer, Mr. Gillis. A bit longer. But the river is notorious here. Sheer murder. Someday I mean to prove that steam can tame the Mississippi. I'll need my boat for that. What if we lose her to the shoals? Then I'll lose her to the shoals, not to gunfire. Very well, sir. Now, perhaps? A bit longer. All right. Start the starboard engine. Aye, sir. Start the larboard engine. Aye. Showers of sparks from the stacks. A Roman candle in the river. No guns yet. No guns yet. Come ahead on both engines. We're going in. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of our story of Henry Miller Shreve. Nowadays, it seems to be a common complaint among parents that there aren't enough constructive pastimes to keep the children busy during their free hours. As one mother put it, they dance and sing and paint in school, but once they're home, they try to annihilate each other with space guns. Well, that may not be the case at your house, but you know there is one easy way to teach the youngsters to use their hands and to be thoughtful of others at the same time. Just supply them with Hallmark Make Your Own Valentine Kits. Each of these colorful kits contains several valentines the youngsters can make with ease. You can choose from simple punch-out designs or valentines that actually move after they're put together. Or lacy Hallmark Valentines with little figures and pop-out springs. Best of all, they cost just 29 cents, 59 cents, or 79 cents a kit, including mailing envelopes. You'll recognize Hallmark Make Your Own Valentine Kits by the familiar Hallmark and Crown on the package, the symbol you always look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Risking enemy guns in the treacherous river, in dead darkness, Henry Miller Shreve's enterprise brought the badly needed arms to Jackson's army. Then, with the war over, the peacetime cargoes loaded onto the idle enterprise, excited preparations for the long-anticipated attempt to reach Louisville by steamboat. <laughs> Falls astern. Broad Mississippi widens before the cutwater of the Enterprise. Two days up the river, and the dream, the beautiful bubble, bursts again. thing after another, Mary. Now a cylinder bursts. Men die. People are bitter against us. But we're ready to cast off again. A cylinder bursts. That tragedy may hold progress in the river for a fatal generation. Fulton's New Orleans failed, Mary. 
Who shall succeed? You, Henry. America has no time to lose. We're a small, new nation in a society of giants. We must grow strong quickly or fall again under the yoke of the powerful. I believe that, Mary. But a cylinder bursts. Yes. Henry Miller Shreve. And this is Mrs. Shreve. Madam. Sir. I am here in the interest of Mr. Robert Fulton. Inventor of the steamboat, who also holds the exclusive franchise to operate his steamboats on the Mississippi River. I hadn't heard of that. If you persist in your attempt to reach Louisville, Mr. Fulton will bring legal action. But if I succeed, it will be to his advantage. So far, your steamboat has killed a number of its crew. It also ran vital supplies to our troops. Mr. Fulton is convinced that your present project can only end in failure that will cast discredit on the steamboat. Well, then perhaps I have more faith in the steamboat than its inventor has. Mr. Shreve, you will be enjoined from moving your boat from this wharf. Now, if you do reach Louisville, you will be arrested. Mr. Fulton and I are working toward the same goal, each according to his own conscience. If I were in Mr. Fulton's place, I might do just as he is doing, and he would do just as I propose to do. We're that close in spirit. And just what do you propose to do? For the present, thank you and good evening. Good evening, Mr. Shreve. Mrs. Shreve. Good evening, sir. Oh, no time to lose, Mary. Gillis! Mr. Gillis! Yes, sir? How quickly can you be ready to cast off? Three hours. It's a long way to Louisville, and we may be arrested when we get there. Are you still with me? I'll get ready, sir. Oh, we're on our way to Louisville, Mary. Without a cargo? We'll stop for cargo along the river. It's now or never, Mary. It's now. <laughs> The Enterprise is a ghost seeking a safe channel in the river, in the thick darkness, probing and shuddering its way northward. Yellow Mississippi, great water, yellow quicksilver slithering over the plains, Memphis, Vicksburg, St. Louis, and high water moving down the Ohio from Louisville. Henry, you hear what everybody says. What waters at Louisville? It's been getting worse and worse fighting the current in the high water, Henry. That's your boat too, Mary. What shall we do? I... I don't know. Stay tied up here at St. Louis. We have a cargo of food, medicines, blankets, lots of things, and they all can be used up there, Mary. Louisville's cut off. By the time we get up there, if we do, the river will have started to fall. Disease and hardship at their worst. You'll get lost in those waters. There won't be a true channel anywhere. Blind alleys and dead ends everywhere. You will hang the boat up on a reef and, and break in two and rot in the river. It's your boat, too. Well, Mary? Louisville, Henry, of course. <laughs> Day and night, night and day, Mississippi water wiping out the levees, obliterating the land. Then the mighty Ohio, a sinewy torrent fighting the steamboat. Or still flat water, slick and featureless and deadly. At night, the widening flood waters are a shoreless sea, unearthly and desolate. Then, Louisville just around the bend, wherever the bend may be in that waste of water, Louisville ahead, and the worst to come. Why aren't we getting faster soundings from that ledgeman, Mr. Gillis? Keeps fouling his line and submerged trees and fences. We can't founder now. The people of Louisville have heard our whistle. They're counting on us. Uh, three. We're losing some depth, sir. Look, look ahead there. That's reef water, I think. Well, soon enough, no. Both engines, easy as you go. Nothing to do but wait. Uh, Twain! Fifteen feet. Still room and to spare, sir. But losing. Uh, Twain! Twelve feet. Yeah. Uh, less Twain! Oh, nine. Give 
gives us only two feet under our keel, sir. It's a bluff reef. Sure as thunder. Yes, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. crash into us, sir. Oh, run over it. You don't know how high she stands. I'm waiting to find out. Seven and one out feet. Six inches to spare, sir. Six inches. I know that for myself, Mr. Gillis. There'll be no time to reverse, Agent. No. Seven and one out feet. It's holding at seven and one half. I'm, I'm going to chance it. Both engines, boys. Full speed forward. Full speed forward. Say a prayer, boys. They're going into that reef. They're over it. We're over, men. The New Orleans is a little different from the way we left it, eh? Oh, what a wonderful welcome for us, Henry. How uh, exciting. Extraordinary. A lot of gold braid on that wharf there. Upon my soul. What is it? That grim gentleman there. That's General Andrew Jackson himself. Why, him? I guess Mr. Robert Fulton is a very powerful man, Mary. He couldn't arrest us up in flooded Louisville, but he can back here. Mr. Henry Miller Shreve. Yes, General. There's a warrant out for your arrest. Yes, sir. It seems you're accused of opening the Mississippi River to the steamboat in an immeasurable commerce on the river. You're further charged with bringing aid and comfort to the United States forces at New Orleans. As though, sir, this was not enough, you then committed the offense of turning your vessel about to bring relief and life to the stricken people of Louisville. Is... is that how it reads, sir? <laughs> not exactly, but that's how I read it. Mr. Shreve, you've brought civilization and humanity to an American frontier. You've assured the progress and prosperity of America on both shores of the Mississippi, perhaps as far as both oceans. I think that Mr. Fulton will be among the first to applaud your service to America and to his steamboat. Sir, if I've done my share in assuring the future of America and the Mississippi, I'm, I'm very happy I want no applause. Oh, Henry. Excuse me a moment, General. Certainly, sir. Mr. Gillis? I said. How about a salute for General Andrew Jackson? Mississippi Empire to Commerce and the building of America. He did more. He invented a snag boat to clear the rivers of sunken logs and other obstacles. With this boat, he cleared the tremendous log jam that had blocked the Red River of Louisiana for hundreds of years. During that time, he camped at Bennett's Bluff, where today stands the thriving city of Shreve. A city named for the man whom we honor tonight on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Now, I'll be back in just a minute to give you a little preview of next week's story. But first, here's a word from Frank Goss, who's been reading some love poems. <laughs> That's right, Mr. Barrymore. The other night, as I browsed through my family books, I came across a volume of love poems by James Whitcomb Riley. It was an old volume, long out of print. And nestled between the pages was a handmade valentine. Someone had written on it in a round, childish hand, to the only girl in the world from your devoted Jimmy. Now, I assume Jimmy was one of my grandmother's young swains, because in those days all valentines were made by hand and sent only to the object of one's affection. Today, of course, our habits have changed. Most of us like to remember our relatives and close friends as well as our husband or wife or sweetheart on February 14th. And it's such an easy thing to do when you can choose from the big collection of Hallmark valentines at your favorite store. 
you'll find there's a Hallmark Valentine that seems custom-made for everyone dear to you. Gay, amusing ones to bring a smile to the lips and a tug of happiness to the heart. And you can be sure of it. The Hallmark on the back of every Valentine you mail will carry an extra message. For it means you carry enough to send the very best. And now here again is Mr. Barrymore. You know, as I was listening to Frank, I, I was reminded of one of my very favorite quotations. Leibniz once said, to love is to place one's happiness in the happiness of others. Yeah. And, and I suppose that's the one main purpose of Valentine's Day. Just to stop a moment and let our friends and relatives know we love them. Just one little gesture in a busy day in this troubled world... <laughs> That sure needs a lot of the spirit of love. Yep, Valentine's Day is a day to place our happiness in the happiness of others. Mr. Barrymore, whose story are we presenting on the Hallmark Hall of Fame next week? Huh? Oh, oh, oh you got me philosophizing <laughs> about the spirit of love and thy neighbor and all that stuff. Well, I almost forgot. Well, next week we have another true-to-life story, this time about a woman remarkable woman whose courage and bravery were dedicated to the saving of lives at sea. Her name was Ida Lewis, and her inspiring story is an exciting one, which we'll call Woman Against the Sea. Hope you'll all be here listening. Our hallmark hall of fame is every Sunday. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our music was composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Milton Geiger. Until next Sunday then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Henry Miller Shreve was portrayed by Lamont Johnson, with Barbara Eiler as Mary, Parley Bear as the storekeeper, Tom Tully as the sergeant, James McCallion as the sheriff, Ted DeCorsi as Andrew Jackson, and Herb Butterfield as Mr. Gillis. Every Sunday, Hallmark Cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. The Hallmark Hall of Fame on radio with host Lionel Barrymore, and on television with Miss Sarah Churchill. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor Ida Lewis on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.